It's fair to say that my career was off to a slow start. I never really had a job, and I got fired from the first company that I founded. They said I was too much of a dreamer. They called me a, a poet. See, that doesn't mean that I wrote poetry all day, but I'm just someone that's interested in language and people and how they influence each other. I mean, language is interesting, right? We use it to speak, we use it to write, we even use it to think. When I walked out here today, you probably said to yourself, I wonder what he's going to talk about. You see, we use language to describe ourselves and make sense of the world around us, but what happens to our sense of self and our perception of reality if we start outsourcing language to artificial intelligence? Speaking of artificial intelligence, you are here today a part of a very significant moment in history because this is the first TED Talk that was written by ChatGPT. So everything I'm saying was written by technology. I'm just delivering the words. I'm a vessel. It is interesting, right? Like, where does technology end and where do I begin? Or is there no such distinction anymore? Let's explore that a bit more. I'd like you to meet my friend uh, Adam somehow. Let's click Adam. That's interesting. I have this friend who's not appearing, but he will be here soon. Ah, there he is. It's Adam. And Adam, like most of us, he grew up on Earth. Ah. Batteries, maybe? Ah, there he is. Yeah, like most of us, he grew up on Earth, and, and that's where we are today, right? And Adam's story is quite interesting, but it's not just his story, it's everybody's story. So this TED Talk is about you too, actually. Because, you know, Adam, his life, it's, it's like a little spiral, right? First, he, he starts with, you know, focusing on basic levels of surviving, and eventually he'll have a more integrated world view. It's like a little spiral staircase. He's focused on himself, then he starts to care more about other people, then he starts to care about the world around him, and maybe one day he'll reach that level of enlightenment where he feels connected with everything and, and everyone. And throughout his life, language is really important to Adam. First, he's got to learn it, but you know, then he also uses it to develop himself, right? He reads books, he talks to people, he watches movie, and every time he does that, it helps him shape who he is, his beliefs and how he sees the world and his perception of self. But lately, Adam is talking to artificial intelligence a lot. Yeah. Isn't he? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, which is interesting, right? So he talks to it directly via chatbots, uh, but also some of the people that he's talking to ec are echoing ideas that were given to them by artificial intelligence. Sometimes he's talking to people, he's not even really sure if the words coming out of somebody's mouth are authentic or if they were actually written by artificial intelligence. You might be wondering similar things yourself right now, but it is interesting, and this, whoa, this part of artificial intelligence, that's where I enter Adam's life. You see, I now run a school where I teach people how to design AI-powered conversations. And a lot of my students, they're, they're not engineers, they're creatives, they're writers, designers, linguists, philosophers, they're poets. And they work at organizations that are trying to create chatbots that can talk to customers or employees or patients or citizens. And, I try to help them do that in a more human-centered and inclusive way. Uh, most of my students, they, they have that passion for language and people and how they influence each other. I mean, language is really fascinating. Philosopher Ellen Watts, he describes these uh, ghosts in language. You see, a, a table is made of wood, but is a tree made of wood? Of course not, a tree is wood, the same way that a mountain is not made of rock, it is rock, right? It's quite interesting. My finger can point, but it cannot point at itself, much like my tooth cannot bite itself. In a way, language is the menu, but it's not the meal. It's the map rather than the territory. 
if you try to use language to describe the world, you're always going to come up short. That's why transcendental experiences tend to take place beyond language, through art, through music, through medicine or meditation. If you look at the world through the lens of language, you're going to discover that life isn't really a puzzle to be solved, but a mystery to be enjoyed. And now, AI is running away with Adam's life. I mean, he thinks he lives in the real world, but actually language is a prison that prevents him from exploring reality. And now AI is walking off with his life. So what is AI and how does it work, right? At the end of the day, AI is a prediction system. Engineers have taken everything that was written online, they put that in a machine learning model, and then they try to find patterns. And based on those patterns, AI can generate new ideas based on a prediction system, right? And AI can do a lot. ChatGPT, the most famous one, uh, it can write research reports, it can write articles, it can write uh, legal papers. I mean, it can carry a conversation. It can even write a TED talk. It's really impressive and it's gonna change the world. But how will people like Adam experience this, right? Well, it's gonna, sure, AI, it's gonna take jobs and it's gonna change jobs. But people like Adam will, will use it to be more productive, more creative, it will help with decision making. It's gonna automate a lot of those dreadful, repetitive tasks. So it's pretty cool. But perhaps more importantly, is how will it change Adam? How will it change his sense of self and, and perception of reality? There are, in a way, three scenarios. We have our worst case scenario, we've got our eh, scenario, and then we've got our best case scenario. So the worst case scenario, in a way, has to do with biases, right? A lot of people have biases. We have these beliefs that aren't really based on fact, but they drive a lot of our behavior. Right? And when we express ourselves, a lot of those biases end up in the data that we then use to train these artificial systems on. Right? So if we have toxic ideas or negative beliefs and we train the systems on that, then those ideas spread and influence people. And we kind of don't want that. So let's say we've got, you know, we've got a unicorn and a dragon. Both are really cool mythical creatures. I would say mythical creatures, all mythical creatures are created equal. There's no clear distinction of who's better than the other, right? Uh, I think that's an important thing to say. But now let's say we have a group of people that think that unicorns are super cool and that dragons kind of suck, right? And they're very vocal about that and they talk about that a lot and they say, yeah, we're on team unicorns, dragons are rubbish. Well, what happens then is that these AI systems, they start to think that unicorns are actually better than dragons, even though they're clearly not, right? And now if people start interacting with these AI systems, these systems are telling them that unicorns are far better than dragons, and that's not good. So if we look at Adam in his spiral journey in his life, you know, he's initially, you know, he cares about himself. He starts to care about other people. He wouldn't hurt a fly in the wall. He thinks all mythical creatures are created equal. But now he's talking to a robot that keeps telling him that robot, that unicorns are way better. And now Adam's like, hmm, they might be some, onto something there. So where he is initially progressing his life all the way to perhaps enlightenment, he's now talking to a robot and he's just falling off a cliff right back to the Middle Ages, where he's more focused on himself and thinks that unicorns are best and dragons are rubbish. So I don't think we want that, right? This is how you now see families and societies fall apart because we're amplifying the wrong ideas and beliefs. We don't want that. But scenario two, we have, you know, people are aware of biases. Researchers and developers and engineers, we're all coming up with mechanisms and protocols of how we can kind of filter out these biases so that we're not spreading these negative ideas. In a way, it's like, you know, Adam in these situations, he'll have the benefits of the technology, like he'll be more productive and more creative, 
but we're also not taking really control. We're kind of rolling the dice on where this is gonna take us. It's, you know, the huh scenario. So I'm saying if we know language is gonna influence people, and we now have technology that allows us to influence people, why not take control? Let's go big. Let's figure out who we want to be and then associate values to that and put that in the system. Because what would it be like at the top level of that spiral? What would people be like? Adam would be more compassionate, feel one with nature and people. You know, he'd be a very good and kind person. He'd be a very inclusive person, very human-centered, everybody's friends. So why don't we take those values and we could actually put that in the AI systems and we could teach AI to help us become better people. And instead of Adam falling off a cliff, he would actually accelerate his progress all the way, perhaps all the way up to enlightenment. And that's not just Adam. That's all of us, right? If we now figure out what kind of values we want to promote and we put that into these systems, then we can actually take control of where we're going. But how would we do that? Well, here's one idea. We got to bring in the poets. If you're building AI, don't just leave it to the engineers. If you're doing a project, find the poets in your organization and bring them on to the project and give them a fair seat at the table with the engineers. This is very important that we do that for governments and universities and enterprises. Go and find your poets. Power to the poets. But before we end here, I do feel like we got to address the elephant in the room a little bit. Did ChatGPT actually write this talk? It did, most of it. I mean, I had it come up with different ideas. We were brainstorming. It created different outlines. It created a few drafts. It helped me explain concepts like spiral dynamics in simpler ways. And I, I, AI made these beautiful cartoons. I was really impressed with how good it was. But it took me, a human, or someone like Adam, or someone like yourself, to do that. So I had to engineer the prompt to get something that I could then use. And then I took that and I curated it and I designed it and I polished it up to turn it into a coherent story. So there's two jobs for you already, prompt engineering and conversation design. And they're jobs for poets. Maybe they're not just jobs, they might actually be future life skills. And if we bring in the poets now, then like 10 years from now, 50 years from now, 500 years from now, when AI systems, artificial intelligence has far surpassed human intelligence and nobody knows how any of these systems work anymore, then if we bring in the poets today, we will at least know that it was created with the right intention. And it's created with the right intention to help folks like Adam and yourself and everybody living on this earth. And perhaps maybe 10,000 years from now, somebody will be on stage on a red dot somewhere and saying that AI is not a puzzle to be solved, but a mystery to be enjoyed. Thank you.